this week. Clearview app lets strangers find your information through facial recognition. TravelX begins their reboot uh, from the VPN bug they got hit with. ADP users hit by a phishing scam. Exposed Telnet ports lead to over 500,000 IoT devices credentials stolen. And over 1,000 local governments reported that they were hit by ransomware in 2019. In the expert commentary, we welcome, as ever, Jason Wood of Paladin Security to talk about how the FBI is to inform election officials about hacking attempts. So stay tuned for this episode of Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV courses live and on demand, so there's no need to send staff to off-site training. Team subscriptions include Pro Portal, so managers have full control over your team's training schedule. Go to itpro.tv slash hack naked and use the code HN30 to try it free for seven days and receive 30% off your monthly membership. As technology continues to evolve and expand, so have the countless ways our critical systems can be put in jeopardy. Ransomware attacks, misconfiguration, user error, and malicious threat actors, to name a few. As IT infrastructures continue to grow and diversify, how do you ensure stable security? Core Security, a help systems company, provides an analytics-driven, layered approach to security with a portfolio that enables both proactive and reactive responses. With Core Security, you can reduce risk by limiting access, detect upcoming and active threats, test for security weaknesses, and efficiently monitor data for actionable insights. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Welcome to the Security Weekly News for the week of 19 January 2020. I'm your host, Doug White. Um, our next webcast is February 13th with Sri Sundra Oh, Sundaralingam, I did it okay last week. Sri Sundaralingam, almost got it. Vice President Product and Solution Marketing at Extra Hop where we will discuss cloud native network uh, detection and response. Register for upcoming webcast by visiting securityweekly.com, selecting the webcast drop down from the top menu bar and clicking registration. So let's get to the news of the week. Wow, there was, there's always so much news and just trying to sort of gel it down is, is crazy. So uh, Clearview, uh, this week started talking about how they've got facial recognition down. So this is an AI-based application that they're that people are using. And okay, so this is Enter the Skynet. So it's finally here. If you wanted, you know, to say goodbye to that reasonable expectation of privacy, well, here you go. This week, a lot of chatter about this Clearview AI, which says it has scraped three billion pictures off of social media and then matches all these up with tags that they got off social media. So if you have your tag on that big tattoo you got last year before DEF CON, thanks Dave, well, you know, probably they can spot you just by that. But this goes on into this whole total facial recognition, minority report, you name it, and it starts to become really complicated in the real world. So the second story then, at the same time as all this is going on, the United States uh, Congress is holding hearings on all this and more in the House Oversight Committee. So these House committees, if you never never had any dealings with this, the House committees actually uh, hold hearings just like sort of like court hearings. They have testimony, they have experts and so on. Uh, and they ha they're holding hearings on this very thing. One of the main concerns they have right now in this article was about the high error rate with facial recognition for or people of color and women. Uh, now, they're also looking at general privacy and the current trends by law enforcement to use facial recognition for identification purposes and or identifying people that have warrants and such on them. So all this starts to boil down into this huge, huge, giant cauldron of bubbling controversy that we call privacy. So Currently, there's a lot of, you know, discussion about, well, you willingly surrender your whole life 
on Facebook. So you take photographs, you, you take movies and put them on TikTok, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think one of the main concerns is given the pace of legislation uh, historically and the pace of technology, I'm kind of betting on Sky Knight, Sky, Sky Knight, Skynet, and I graciously welcome our AI overlords. So, so you heard it here first. Uh, but other stories reported that facial, facial recognition is, is the one issue that both sides in D.C. can agree on and that it is a dangerous tech. So there's some, you know, stuff coming out of, of that world. Uh, at the same time as all that's going on, uh, there are also stories coming out uh, from some skeptical lawmakers about what this may entail in terms of business, that if we start suppressing this, and Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google, um, I still don't know exactly what the difference in those two things is, but they say, you know, Alphabet and Google. Uh, he basically said that it was important that we start imposing regulations on AI. Price Waterhouse and Coopers, a famous accounting firm, uh, if you've ever seen that sign in Times Square, um, they actually have a position at Price Waterhouse now, uh, I know, and Coopers, uh, called the Responsible AI Lead, and that's Maria Ax, Ax I don't know how to say that, Ax, Accente maybe? Maria Accente echoed the sentiment from Google Alphabet that AI and the use of AI for various things is obviously a great concern. And, you know, you want Skynets? Well, AI is probably how you get Skynets, and facial recognition is sort of the first step down that road. Um, Google went on to support the EU's proposal for inst instating a temporary ban on facial recognition and facial recognition AI until the regulations can be beefed up, uh, essentially saying we need to ban this until we have a chance to figure out what to do about it. Um, but this was a move that was criticized by the White House um, as an innovation stifler. So um, the White House uh, CTO, Michael Kratzios, came out and he said that, uh, that the White House was not very excited about this. Uh, he introduced this whole concept at CES and said, well, maybe uh, we need to hold off on passing any regulations and not go down that road too quickly. Uh, in the same news, Facebook, uh, then uh, they've got ordered to turn over data on thousands of applications that have possibly mishandled users' personal information. Imagine that. A Massachusetts judge ordered them to turn this information over in a lawsuit. Facebook's still fighting this lawsuit, obviously. Uh, but all of this came out of Facebook admitting that it had suspended tens of thousands, quote, uh, of apps for possible violations. I, nobody really knows what all that means, and I guess this judge is trying to find out. I certainly have always had that sneaking suspicion that Facebook might be watching me. I don't know. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, but they probably are. They're probably bored if they're watching me. Uh, how about this one? TravelX. Oh, wow. TravelX has still not fixed the Pulse VPN bug that caused them to get taken out on New Year's Eve. So we, we said Happy New Year's three weeks ago. They're still saying, uh-oh. Uh, they were supposedly hit with a Sodena Kibbe, I don't know how to say that. I know what it is, but I don't know how to say it. The, the Sodena Kibbe ransomware, and they had to take all their customer-facing uh, information down. Um, last night, they did claim in a news article that they had started to bring pieces of their customer system back online. Yikes, that's about three weeks ago. That gets a little bit uh, worrisome. In the scams of the new year, uh, ADP, well, it wouldn't be tax season without a tax scam to go along with it. And a phishing site, which looks like ADP, the automatic data processing company, was used along with phishing email directed at ADP employees to get ADP credentials. So these kind of credential stuffing attacks are gonna then turn around and allow you to get into the ADP site. And if you can get into the ADP site, well, they collect an awful lot of data about their customers. And if you have all that customer data, then you can turn right around and start spear phishing individuals. And we all know that every tax season produces massive numbers of IRS scam type attacks, phone calls, emails, you name it. Uh, they're out there trying it. 
Uh, I wouldn't be shocked at all if some of the fishers start sending out snail mails because remember, the IRS does not call you, nor do they email you. They uh, either send a U.S. Marshal with a ball bat to drag you back, or they send you a snail mail letter. Actually, they send you a letter first. The, the Marshal comes later when, you know, Willie Nelson doesn't reply because he was really wasted that day uh, or that year or that five or seven years. And then, you know, finally the U.S. Marshals show up with the ball bat and drag you back to wherever, I don't know, IRS interrogation headquarters somewhere. But basically you should get a letter. I'm surprised that the guy, uh, the, sna the uh, fishers have not started doing that uh, uh, at this point by sending out actual snail. I guess it's too expensive. So, to, you know, you have to put a stamp on snail mail. You can't just send out 100 million emails an hour off of a spam server. At the same time, Telnet credentials. Really? I mean, really? I, I, I mean, it's 2020, and we're still talking about Telnet. So say it isn't so, but... It is. Someone dumped 515,000 credentials from routers, servers, and IoT devices on a public forum for hackers. Um, I'm sorry, but you know I've been telling people to quit using Telnet since literally the first time I saw the interweb back in like 1996. I, I mean, I, we first started connecting that. It was around about 96, we were putting connections into this internet thing. And I started saying, you know, we probably shouldn't actually be using unencrypted credentials because, you know, my username and password is being sent down the wire. Telnet is bad, bad, bad. I mean, it is, it is the worst. Please don't use Telnet and FTP. Please switch to SSH. But you can't, right? Because you've got IoT devices and they go, oh, yeah, we have Telnet built into it. we got routers with Telnet built into it. And that is absolutely terrifying. In the bad news category then, mobile banking malware surged in the first half of 2019, a massive increase in the number of sites that were targeting phones. So for years and years and years, everyone kind of always had that lame, and I know it's lame, but it was a lame cop out that phones are not that heavily targeted, that it's hard to compromise iPhones, that not much malware is written for this. But we've, we certainly know today that both iPhones and Android phones are heavily targeted. Uh, these types of attack come out of ma a mage cart. And mage cart, if you've heard about that kind of attack, uh, primarily focuses on using forms on websites to skim credentials so they get you to go log in. So it really kind of gets back to that sort of credential stuffing attack uh, and they send all this stuff back to uh, the home server with that type of attack. I did put a link to an article explaining mage card attacks uh, and there are, uh, there are more and more sophisticated versions of mage card coming out. So people are starting to use it as a framework. You've heard us talk about that in the past, that we're seeing those kind of frameworks. And I, but I now see people all the time using their phones to hit websites. Uh, you probably are. You may be watching this on a website on your phone. And I don't think people think about malware the same way when they're, I, I know I don't, uh, when they're using their, their phone to access things on the internet that they, they have that level of consideration back at home on a PC or a, Mac, a MacBook or something. On the same line of attack, well, the FBI, we're, we have expert commentary about the FBI in a minute, but the FBI this week seized a domain. So they actually went out and seized a domain. If you go to that site now, uh, probably shouldn't, but they've got a banner up saying it's been seized, so they got kind of like electronic uh, police tape across it. WeLeakData.com uh, claimed to be hosting a roughly 12 billion records, uh, and they claim this came from over 10,000 breaches. Now, they weren't supposedly the ones who did the breaches. They were just hosting the results of all these breaches. But they offer subscriptions. Um, you know, currently, I think that site is probably down for good. But, you know, somebody's just going to move this somewhere else. Um, in even further shocking but not shocking news for the week, uh, a report came out in December, which I just saw uh, yesterday, so I, I'm reporting on it now. Uh, roughly 948 local governments in the United States reported, so this is just who reported, ransomware attacks in 2019. 
this, uh, and I put a link to that report, so if you'd like to read it. Uh, the report, of course, doesn't have any information about unreported attacks, but they did go on to report that the reason so many local governments, and I'm going to give you my reason too, but one of the reasons uh, was that they were more likely to pay up. And according to me, well, I, my experience personally, I mean, my personal experience with these phone calls, they are very less likely to have IT staff, security staff, backups, you name it. And oftentimes, you know, when, when somebody called me asking for help, I knew they must be in a bad way because there was somebody calling me saying, hi, I saw you speak in New Jersey seven years ago, and I was really thinking maybe you could do us some help. Uh, for me, there's been about a 300% increase in this type of thing and these types of calls that I got in 2019. Very, very frightening stuff. Because And the, and the other reason I was going to give you is that uh, these are the weak link in chains now. So these local governments are getting plugged into state governments, getting plugged into federal governments. Um, is Kevin Mitnick Satoshi Nakamoto? I couldn't resist this story. Well... Kevin loves to talk about Bitcoin in that kind of like, well, you know, way that he does. And he has a black T-shirt and a hoodie. Uh, and, and he has a picture of himself in a black T-shirt there. Uh, so uh, maybe. Uh, but we all talk about Bitcoin. We all talk about blockchains. And that doesn't mean that we're Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, according to this article, basically says that despite... Uh, Mr. Minting being the self-proclaimed world's most famous hacker. I don't, I don't know about that claim. It may be true. Um, I, most everybody knows who he is, so maybe he is the world's most famous. I think he's an ex-hacker, though, of sorts. I don't personally think, and they don't personally think, that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. But who knows? With that, we will take a short break, and we'll be back with expert commentary and deep, dulcet tones of Jason Wood. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from zero to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back to Security Weekly News. At this point, as always, we welcome Jason Wood, founder of Paladin Security. And Jason is going to talk about how, uh, how the FBI is now supposed to inform election officials about hacking attempts. Jason, welcome uh, back. Hey, good to be here. And uh, yeah, the uh, the FBI has made it official and released a, a directive, policy directive, basically saying that they will now uh, or are supposed to notify state and local election officials of attacks against their their organization, their infrastructure, things like that. Now, the uh, the headline actually caught my attention because this was initially on the Naked Security blog said the FBI to inform election officials about hacking attempts. Okay, as you read through the thing, the, the, the content, it's, it's actually not attempts. It's more like threat intel about things that could happen. Uh, the, and they link to the FBI's uh, press release about this, which also goes on to talk about that same idea of notifying uh, state and local officials, uh, election officials, about, as they put it, cyber intrusions affecting election infrastructure. Now, all of this sounds like something that we would probably look at and say, well, that should have been going on for a while. I mean, how long, how many years have we been talking about election security in uh, in this field? And, uh, you know, now it's starting to finally get a little bit more traction. What my initial thought when I saw this headline was, is how is the FBI going to know about what attacks are actually occurring at a uh, county or state somewhere? And how are they going to notify them in any kind of manner that of time that actually will matter? Um, and it turns out that, like I said, that's not exactly what they're talking about. They're, they're focusing more on uh, threat intel, and, uh, it seems to me at least, and about where attacks maybe coming from and maybe what the attacks will be looking like. Uh, 
The FBI's press release states, and I quote, the FBI's new policy recognizes the necessity of notifying responsible state and local officials of credible cyber threats to election infrastructure, end quote. So obviously the FBI has decided that, hey, maybe we should let them know what we're finding out about threats to elections and the infrastructure that hosts them. Um, one of the things I thought of when I look at this, and none of the there's no information about this in the press release or, or anything that I found, is what information is actually going to be shared to state and local election officials. Um, you know, obviously they're going to be telling them something about the threat actors. It sounds like hopefully they'll tell them something about how that group operates. You know, some of the tactics tactics and stuff like that. And maybe they'll even get into some of the infrastructure that these uh, election officials could then go and look for to see if they're actually interacting with their environment. Um, and it is always possible, of course, that the, the FBI could say, hey, um, Missouri, we saw attacks occurring in California and we think you're, you might be uh, next on this list. And, you know, so maybe they have that kind of notification going on. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, how could this help the election officials? Now, to be honest, it, it really just depends on the details that are being shared and when they, the information gets there. I've read plenty of uh, bulletins through InfraGuard and stuff like that are so high level that um, there's not much, you know, it's stuff you knew already from the news. And so it, does, it wasn't terribly helpful. So a high level notification that Russia may target some uh, county in Arkansas probably isn't going to be very useful. But um, if the notification goes into things like tactics that they use or maybe even some uh, some infrastructure that's used, those officials could then hopefully they would have the staff to turn around and start looking at that in their environment, maybe writing some preventions or rules to prevent some of that infrastructure from interacting with them. Now, obviously, infrastructure is easy to be torn down and set up somewhere else, relatively easy. Um, but the time window that we have for an election is fairly short. I mean, they, there's a period of time where those systems are, are more important, and then they stop being very important until the next election cycle, at least as far as the results for an individual election goes. So, you know, even just making it Difficult, more difficult for a short period of time could end up being a win for for the election itself. One of the crucial things to me is just how is this going to be implemented? And there's not a lot of information about this at this point. First off, the FBI has to know who they're notifying. And so they're going to have to hunt around, I assume, and find out who it is at the local level that needs notification. The state, that's probably easier to deal with. We only have 50 of those, but I don't know how many counties we have in the U.S. Um, and that shouldn't be too insurmountable even then because an FBI agent calling up tends to get a lot of attention and, and uh, more oh, helpfulness, shall we say, or you know, positive response to maybe we should do something about this than, let's say, your friendly neighborhood security group. What is going to be interesting is how fast this information gets down there to these officials and how useful it is to them, you know, how, how well, how much information is there for them to apply. Um, they have to get it there in a reasonable amount of time because obviously if the notification comes two days after an election is over, it might be too late to be very useful. Uh, if the information is too vague, then it doesn't matter how timely it is, it's probably not going to be useful either. One of the thoughts I had is there's probably going to be some tension inside of the FBI about what it is they're going to share uh, with local and state uh, election officials. Um, one issue is they have no idea how the election officials are going to handle this information. We'll start somebody turn around and start running port scans against the attacker infrastructure. Don't ever do that. Bad idea. Uh, but people do that. They get notification that, hey, here's this IP range that may be attacking your organization, and somebody decides to fire up Nmap and go after it, uh, which then you know definitely provides information to the attackers of what your awareness levels and things like that. 
Uh, will the election or the local officials uh, hold their own press release uh, about the or uh, about what occurred and the information that's been shared with them? That could cause an attacker to change their infrastructure, maybe even some of their tactics. And, you know, if the information is too detailed, will the sources of information that the FBI is gathering this data up from get burned and all of a sudden no longer be available to them? Those are entirely real concerns and definitely stuff that's out of the control of the FBI. So I expect some tension there inside of the FBI about what it is we're going to share and when can we share it with them and things like that. So this is going to be really interesting to see how this develops. At the end of the day, obviously, this sounds like a bit of a common sense idea, something that is good and should be done. Um, I obviously have some questions about how it's going to be carried out. Um, but, you know, election officials probably can use all the help that they can get. I'm picturing very thin IT budgets, much less security budgets going on here. Hopefully, the the primary effect of limiting interference inside of elections will uh, will be reached at some level, and maybe even a secondary benefit uh, of the public feeling a little bit more uh, safe and assured that things are going on to protect the election results. That way, uh, fears and and uh, conspiracy theories and things like that about elections being stolen due to interference from, from some government or subverted, the election was subverted by this government or whatever, uh, are uh, a little less overblown. If you'd like to read more about this policy and, and some of the things that are out there, I've got the links here inside of the show notes. Go ahead and check it out. Definitely something interesting to see how this plays out since we are in a major election year. Thank, thank you, Jason. I, I, I agree with you. I, I definitely, I think there's other issues that, that you brought up there, like uh, tension. Uh, if I'm the mayor of Hapshat, Arkansas, and, you know, I'm running for election and the FBI suddenly announces that, you know, there are threats against the election. One, I think there's gonna be a lot of chaos there. I do think there's mechanisms in place to fusion centers, MSI sec, and all those kind of things to get information to people. Whether or not they hear it is another matter. And I think you said it uh, best when you talked about resources. I think, you know, when you drill down from the state level and even at the state level and you start drilling down into the county, city, you know, they have elections at all those levels. They may literally have no one uh, uh, available on staff to, to deal with this. And then that can lead to even more chaos when you're trying to deal with the yeah. local, you know, everybody calling in. So. Yeah, you may have one sysadmin at that local level, that county. Yep. trying to deal with this and and that's not their primary gig right you know like they're, they're also the like they accountant for the, yeah this the city controller or something too i've seen that and they're like i don't even know what this stuff is i just turn it on in the morning so exactly. yeah scary thank you jason for that excellent commentary and finally today uh mayor pete uh a u.s presidential hopeful if you're unfamiliar uh and he was the only known campaign that actually had a CISO, uh but to, uh, yesterday, they announced that their CISO, uh, Mick Baccio, had resigned due to an internal dispute over how to manage security. Uh, not much in the detail category on that, but TechCrunch reported that Baccio said that he had fundamental philosophical differences with the campaign management regarding the architecture and scope of the information security program. Hey, everybody out there doing security, we've certainly never run into that and butted heads with the PR people, right? But supposedly he was hired to prevent leaking of classified documents a la Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, well, no more. So the only campaign that had a CISO doesn't have one now. Thanks for joining us this week for Security Weekly News. Be sure and tune in Friday for the Security Weekly News wrap-up at 12 o'clock and all the other shows that we have this week. Thanks for joining us. See ya.